So this morning, uh, we are continuing our look uh, through the book of Ephesians, this letter that, uh, that Paul wrote uh, to, initially to a, a group of churches, but it's a letter to, to all of us, um, all of us who, who are in Christ, who seek to follow after him. Uh, and we have, we have one more week left after this week uh, in our look at the book of Ephesians, uh, which means this week we come to the end of chapter 5. Uh, with what might be one of the hardest passages in this, this letter. Um, if you want to follow along, uh, we're going to read it here shortly. Uh, you can find it in the, in the Pew Bible on page 195 of the, of the New Testament. Uh, but this really is, this is probably one of the, the toughest passages in this entire letter. Um, in fact, when I, when I mentioned to somebody that, that I, was, I was preaching through most of the book of Ephesians, the first thing, the very first thing they said to me is, what are you going to do when you get to the end of chapter 5? And I said, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to spend a lot of time reading and meditating on it, and I'm going to pray some more, and I'm going to preach on it, and then I'm going to pray again. Uh, so that's what, that's what we're going to do. Because uh, the truth is, there are hard passages in Scripture, right? They're there, and we need to wrestle with them. Because scripture is God-breathed. It is uniquely inspired by the Holy Spirit. It is God's word that points us to the word made flesh, to the good news of Jesus Christ. So even the hard passages are gifts to us. We need to wrestle with them. Right? We need to explore them. We need to ask questions of them. And we need to allow them to wrestle with us, to explore us to ask questions of us. So that's what we're going to do this morning. Right? We are not going to hit everything and every question that's going to arise from this passage. That's okay. Um, and there is a, there's always an open invitation to come and talk, and we can continue exploring together. Right? Um, one more thing before we read the scripture this morning. Uh, this morning's passage uh, is also it's a really good example of the importance of context, right, and how that comes into play with, with Scripture and the Gospel, right? This passage that we're going to read has been abused, sometimes even as a weapon, to cause harm and to justify things that are not justifiable. And so, so we need to be aware of that when we come to this and explore this passage within the broader context of, of this letter and the broader context of, of who God is, right? This particular passage is in a letter that is written for the church, the universal church, right? It includes us. But it was not initially written to us. What I mean by that is that, is that Scripture is God's word for Christians and all people at all times and places who would, who would know God and the good news of Jesus. But this letter that, that we call Ephesians... Uh, for example, this letter was initially written to a particular part of the church, a specific group of churches in the area of Asia Minor in the ancient world in the first century. Right? These churches were filled with, with people who, who first, um, they were mostly Gentile converts. They had converted from some sort of pagan background. And all of them in these churches, they were, they were born and raised and lived and breathed and moved and, and did their whole life in the midst of the ancient Greco-Roman culture, which like any culture, including ours, it had its own sometimes very unique and particular set of assumptions about life and the way things naturally worked and the way things just ought to be, right? But that culture is not our culture. Ours is, is that of a 21st century Western representative democracy that was founded, at least in part, um, with the aid of certain ideas from the Enlightenment, ideas about and assumptions about personal freedom and individual rights and autonomy and things like that. And just like their culture, our culture, by extension us, right, our culture has its own underlying assumptions about all sorts of things how things are and how they should be and all that. And underlying assumptions always come with their own set of blind spots, whether you're living in the first or the 21st century. All right, so here's the point. 
the unchanging truth and goodness of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, if it is to have any true power, and if it is to give any real and lasting hope, it will always come in and take root in the soil of the particulars of time and place, whatever they may be. It will always challenge and question, sometimes lift up, but it will always push back against and seek to change certain particulars of any given culture or context. And that is good news. That is really good news because it means that God is really at work in history. And the exclamation mark on that is the incarnation, right? The word made flesh and dwelt among us. God's ultimate and final act of redemption is through this specific and particular person, Jesus of Nazareth, who lived a particular life and died a specific and real death at the hands of a particular kingdom embedded in a particular culture. And then within history, at a particular time and place, he really rose from the dead. We don't worship an abstract idea, right? We worship a God who speaks and acts. And speaking and acting always happen within and sometimes through the particulars of history. So to say that scripture comes to us within a certain context, it's contextualized, is to proclaim that truth. And we should rejoice in that because it means that God really does work in and through life and history and circumstance. And that means that God is at work in our history and in your history, in our lives and in your life, and within our particular circumstances and within your particular circumstances. Jesus speaks his unchanging goodness into the particulars of your changing circumstances. That is the only way that redemption can happen. So here, in this passage that we're about to read, Paul is writing these inspired words that speak through and into a particular circumstance, proclaiming that God is at work redeeming and questioning, renewing and challenging, reclaiming and subverting what the culture and the old patterns of life assume to be true. And the result is a passage that does command those of us who are in Christ to believe in him and seek to follow him. It is a passage that should make us nervous because it does command us to live in a way that is at odds with how we think things should go. If we take it seriously, it will challenge and offend us. But perhaps, perhaps, not exactly in the way we initially think. In fact, it might actually challenge and even offend us way more than that. So are you ready? Here we go, let's pray. Lord, as we open up your word, uh, your word that is a gift for us, your word that is alive and at work through the Spirit, Lord, we pray that these ancient words would find a way into our hearts, that they would take root, that they would begin to grow in us even more and more a faith and a confidence in your goodness, and that they would challenge us to seek after you in all places and at all times and in all circumstances. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So Ephesians 5, 21 through 33. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, be subject to your husbands as you are to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife just as Christ is the head of the church, the body of which he is the Savior. Just as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, in order to make her holy by cleansing her with the washing of water by the word, so as to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or anything of the kind. Yes, so that she may be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as they do their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. <coughs> For no one ever hates his own body, but he nourishes and tenderly cares for it, just as Christ does for the church. 
because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a great mystery, and I am applying it to Christ and the church. Each of you, however, should love his wife as himself, and a wife should respect her husband. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. So glad you said that. You didn't even say it with a question. Thanks be to God. So when we look at this passage... The first thing we need to remember is that, that the divisions of chapters and verses and even section headings uh, were not in Paul's original letter, right? They were put there by translators and interpreters to help us. But like anything that is designed to help us, sometimes it causes problems. Uh, so for example, there are translations of this passage uh, that begin a brand new section with verse 22. Wives be subject to or sometimes submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. But we began at verse 21. Be subject. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Right? And that's actually, if we were going to really say where this section starts, that's where it starts. Because in Paul's original writing, in the Greek that he wrote in, verses 21 and 22 are all one sentence. And it's a transition sentence from, from last week's passage about, about a life of thanksgiving and worship and this, this kind of overflow of, of singing and, and worship that goes on in the, in the, in the church. Uh, and so it, re it transitions into these, these other more personal, intimate instances. And so what Paul wrote literally reads like this. Being subject or submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, wives to your own husbands as to the Lord. Right? The word be subject to or submit to is not actually in verse 22 where it starts talking about wives and husbands. There is no verb in that sentence. It's not there. You can't find it anywhere. And that's important because it means that the controlling idea over all that follows in this entire section is this phrase, be subject or submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Verse 21 lays out the overarching and guiding thought, and verse 22 is just the first example of verse 21 playing out in a particular real-life circumstance. So any interpretation and reading of this passage has to be controlled by, by this. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so what follows are examples and instances from life, from, from the very personal, even what we might think of as the, as the most private parts of our lives. Instances of how this concept of mutual submission, mutual submission, to one another might work its way, work out in real life. That's the first thing. The second is this. Within this Greco-Roman culture that these churches lived in and moved in and were kind of born into, and within this culture that these Gentile converts would have been most familiar and, and, and enmeshed in, there were common sayings and rules about the ordering of life. Good advice. Right? If you wrote to the Miss Manners of this day and asked how to run, run your household, there are things she would just naturally say that everyone would agree with. Right? They were things called household codes. And these codes, they spoke to the proper ordering of households. These codes, they all spoke of the duty of the wife to submit and obey her husband. Because she was basically property in this culture. And they also spoke of the duty of the child to obey the parents and slaves to their masters, uh, which Paul takes up right after this. Uh, we don't have time this morning to go through it all. Uh, but in general, what Paul does in this part about wives and husbands is going to be real similar to what's going on in those other sections. Right? So there was this common assumed understanding that everybody knew how households ought to be ordered. Wives submitting, children and slaves obeying. Right? This was common sense at this time. This was the way things ought to be. This was just how you assume that society was supposed to work. And so there are certainly commonalities between what those ancient household codes declared and what Paul writes here. But did you notice anything different? Generally speaking, the ancient codes did not declare any duty of the husbands to their wives. And nothing about the duty of parents to their children or masters to slaves or servants, right? Those codes would have been all about the duty owed by the one without power in that society to the one with power. 
Yet Paul very intentionally speaks of the duties the one with the power has to the ones without. In fact, he spends way more time on that, doesn't he? Husbands have a reciprocal duty to their wives, he writes. Parents have a reciprocal duty to their children. Masters a reciprocal duty to their slaves or servants. So when Paul writes, writes here, wives submit or be subject to your own husbands, he is not coming up with that on his own. He is quoting the culture. Right? He is drawing on something that everyone would have recognized. But then Paul gets radical. And he takes this expected and assumed idea that the people in this church would have held to simply be the way things ought to be. And he relativizes it. And he subverts it under the person of Jesus Christ. Okay? He relativizes it by putting it under this broader command for mutual submission out of reverence for Christ. Yes, wives, you should be subject to your husbands, but not because culture says so, Paul says. Or not, and not because husbands or men are somehow inherently above or authoritative over wives or women. Not at all. But simply because all Christians, husbands and wives together, mutually, are called to submit to one another. Okay? Are you with me? And Paul then goes even further than that. Because he doesn't just relativize it in this way, he goes on to completely subvert it by then writing something that was not at all assumed or expected or part of, of the normal cultural codes of the household. He puts in a big section on the husband's duty to the wife. Now the mere fact that Paul includes this, the idea that husbands owe something to their wives, would have been scandalous. Because if you're living in a culture that says wives are property, but then you go and say something crazy like, like wives are owed something by their husbands on this very deep human relational level, well, you are then completely subverting the very idea of wives being property. You are saying no. They are, in fact, equal sharers and partners in this covenant. But only that. But then look at what Paul says the husband's duty is. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Right? When he says love, he uses the strongest word he could. There were occasionally others talking about husbands loving their wives during the, at this time. Um, there weren't a lot of them, but they, they were, they were kind of there on the outskirts. Uh, but when they did, they were, used the word philos. Which means love, but it means love in the sense of affection and being, being nice and treating somebody well, right? But Paul uses the word agape, which means love in the sense of, of self-surrender and sacrifice. It's the word that means a total and selfless, complete giving of yourself for someone else. It's the love that God has and the love that Christ demonstrated which is why Paul switches gears back and forth here, um, talking about Christ's love and the church in the middle of all of this. That is the love, he says, that the husband owes his wife. That is his responsibility, to live his life for her benefit. So think about this for a minute. Just think about the word submit or be subject to alongside the concept of agape love. Right? To submit or be subject or subject yourself to someone. What does that mean? It means to give yourself up to somebody. And to love in this Christ-like way, it means to give yourself up for somebody. Right? Both of these concepts mean that you are living not for your own benefit, but for the benefit of the other person. So as the theologian John Stott writes, submission and love. As it turns out, as Paul is writing about them here, submission and love are two aspects of the very same thing, namely selfless self-giving. In fact, it turns out that they both mean to lose yourself that the other may find his or herself. And again, following Paul's connection here with Jesus and the church, Stop points out that this is at the essence of the gospel of Christ, losing yourself so that the other may find his or herself. Right? This is exactly what Christ did. Loved us so fully, and
and so completely that he gave himself over to us and for us. Right? Christ submitted. Right? He submitted and became subject to the very thing he came to save and redeem. That's what the incarnation that we celebrate at Christmas is all about. That's what the crucifixion that we'll celebrate as we, as we enter into to the time of Easter is all about. That's what Jesus' very life and death is all about. That's what everything about Jesus is about. And so here, in this passage, what Paul is doing is, is calling for one of the most radical things that we could imagine. He's taking as a starting point something from this particular culture and he's showing how the gospel comes in and takes hold of it and completely reorients it. He shows how the gospel gives a completely new understanding of what it means to be in a relationship with somebody, whether that relationship is a, is a romantic one, or as he goes on in, in the verses after ours this morning, talking about children and parents and slaves or servants and masters, right? So whether it's a family or generational relationship or a friendship or an economic or social or political relationship, it is not outside the challenge and redemption of the gospel. And the fundamental point is that there is no place in the community of Christ for ignoring the needs of anyone else. There is no place for demanding your rights when there are others, right, when there are others who have needs that need to be filled. This passage does not tell us what we are owed by others. What it does tell us is what our responsibilities are to those around us. It tells us what we owe others. There's a comedian who had a show on cable TV. I'm not going to say who he is or what his show was because because I don't want anyone to, to think I was recommending it. He's often very crude and coarse, and I don't want the elders to have to call a meeting or anything like that. Right? <laughs> uh, but there was a scene in one episode where he is making food for his kids. And he has an extra slice of fruit, and he offers it to his oldest child. At which point, his youngest child complains that her sister got something she didn't. That's right, he said. Sometimes she gets things you don't, and sometimes it goes the other way. That's just how life works. But daddy, it's not fair. Who said anything about fair? You were just fine without it until she got it. What's the problem? It's just not fair. If she gets one, I should get one too. Look, he said to her. So he leans down and looks into her eyes. The only time you need to worry about what's in your neighbor's bowl is if you're checking to make sure they have enough. Submit. Just to make sure I say it, there is nothing here about having to stay in any sort of abusive relationship. Right? As I mentioned earlier, this passage has been twisted so often to justify husbands abusing and demanding, humiliating obedience and submission from their, from their wives. And, and those following passages, the, the same thing has happened to justify slavery or abuse of children. And, um, these passages have ended up at times being used like a, like a club to demand submission or obedience and things like that. But one of, the many, one of the many tragedies of this is that that type of reading of this passage is the exact opposite of what the passage demands. Because if this passage says anything about power and authority. It is about what is owed by the one with power in any particular context to the one who has less or none, the one who is at the mercy of those with the power. And so if you are in a place of power and authority, whatever it is, this passage makes big time demands of you. And if you are wanting to have power and authority, in whatever context in society that is, the gospel demands that you better be willing to give it up completely, to hand it over, not for what you want or even what you think you need, but for the benefit of those you want to have power over. And that is a message that is truly at odds with how we tend to think the world should work. 
Right? If this isn't a message that shines a big old spotlight into the blind spots of, of a society like ours that has so much to say about independence and pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps, if this isn't a message that confronts and challenges us, relativizing and subverting so many of our basic assumptions and inclinations, if this doesn't do that, friends, I don't know what will. Because that's exactly what's going on here. The Lord calling us into a complete reorientation, a turning away from ourselves to better seek the benefit of others, to live in such a way that our lives are about lifting others up, aiding them in becoming who God is calling them to be, checking the content of their bowls, not to make sure we have gotten our fair share, but to make sure they have enough of what they need. One of the overarching themes of this entire letter, a thread that runs through the whole thing, is that our calling is to be a people whose lives and life together reflect the Lord we worship. And how we do that, the picture that we paint in our life together, and the picture that we paint with, with how we view rights and responsibilities and authority and power and what we do with it when we have it and how that affects those who have less or none, the hard, challenging, and even offensive thing is that the picture we paint with all of that will either proclaim the truth of the gospel to the world or it will deny it to the world. The demands of the gospel, the imperatives of the gospel on each of our lives is nothing less than this. To be a people that show the world the selfless, self-giving, self-emptying love of Christ. That's it. Proclaiming the one who gave up his own life so that we could be holy, so that we could be cleansed by the washing of the water by the word, so that we might be joined with him in splendor without spot or wrinkle or anything of the kind, that we might be holy and without blemish. Family, we are called to be a picture of this very love of Christ to the world, so that everything, even our most intimate and personal relationships, are transformed by the power of the gospel. God at work transforming all things, even our relationships, that even these might then be agents of God's transformation of the world. Through God, these transformed and transforming relationships now at work in Christ, transforming our communities by proclaiming to the world the sacrificial love of God in Jesus Christ. To lose ourselves to Christ others may find themselves in Christ. To live sacrificially because our Lord and Savior lived and died and rose again. Sacrificially for us and for them. This is the essence of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He gave himself up that we might have life. And we, brothers and sisters, are called to do the same. What does the world see when it looks at who we are and how we wield our power? What are we demanding? What are we giving? And who are we lifting up? For all the questions that we may ask of this and other passages, family, that is the deeper and more penetrating fundamental question that scripture asks of us. So we should probably pray. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, for words of challenge, we give you thanks. Because these words of challenge do not come without hope. They do not come without the promise of the very gospel that challenges us. Lord, we give you thanks and we praise you for your sacrificial, self-giving love for us in Jesus Christ. Lord, empower us, fill us with your spirit, with grace and mercy to reflect that, to be that, 
to embody that to all those we have contact with, to fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, and to those who are not in Christ, Lord, that they may see and know your goodness and your steadfast love for each and every one of us. Lord, may we be such a people. Amen.